Okay, so this video will be covering the geometry lab and all of the related topics from Lewis dot structures, the Vesper theory, and all of the related topics to the Vesper theory. Now, starting off, first of all, with the Lewis dot structures over here, these are two-dimensional shaped, uh, two-dimensional shaped structures that are usually drawn for molecular type of molecules and also sometimes they're drawn for ionic type of molecules. Now in order for us to actually draw the correct Lewis dot structure we usually follow two rules. The first one is going to be the octet rule which says that you have to have eight electrons surrounding every atom and then the other rule is going to be the formal charge uh, and with formal charge what we try to do is to um, uh, get an ionic charge of zero, okay, ideally. Now keep in mind that if we're unable to actually get a net ionic charge of zero, what we try to do is to minimize the charges as much as possible. Now um, keep in mind guys that there are going to be structures that obey both of them, okay, so you might be able to get a net ionic charge of zero and a uh, eight electron surrounding every atom and there are going to be other structures that only satisfy one or the other, okay. Now, if a question asks you to uh, draw the Lewis dot structure that satisfies the octet, you cannot draw the Lewis dot structure that satisfies formal charge. And vice versa, if they ask you for formal charge, you cannot draw the one that satisfies the octet. But keep in mind, if the question does not specifically ask for one or the other, you can draw either one and you would be able to get full points on that. Now, there are, there are going to be a couple of elements that will always, always follow the octet. These are going to be the carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine, and it might be really handy knowing these four elements. There are also going to be other um, uh, uh, exceptions to the octet. Now the exceptions to the octet include the following. The first one is going to be an incomplete octet, meaning you have to have less than eight electrons surrounding the, the outer atom. Now obviously we all know hydrogen is the first one on that list. We know hydrogen only has one electron, so it can have a maximum of two making a one bond. So when we're making one bond, we have one electron that belongs to oxygen and another electron that, that, that uh, belongs to hydrogen. They're being shared and therefore we can have a maximum of two. Now with lithium, we're obviously making an ionic bond. Again, the maximum we could have in this case is also two because there's only one bond between the lithium and the fluorine. Uh, in the case of beryllium, okay, since we have, uh, since we actually have two valence electrons and uh, we're able to actually make two bonds, we can have a maximum of four. And boron is one of the uh, famous um, um, examples, okay? We always see this, uh, this particular example on many uh, exams and quizzes. And boron usually can make a maximum of, uh, uh, can, can usually have a maximum of six electrons. So it can make three bonds total, and therefore it can have a maximum of uh, six electrons total. So these are the ones that have an incomplete octet, meaning less than eight electrons. Now the second exception to the octet is going to be those, um, uh, uh, those molecules that have an odd number of electrons. Now whenever we have an odd number of electrons, we know that trouble is actually coming along the way. And the reason for that is because we tend to form what we call as free radicals. Now, free radicals are very, very reactive. They're very unstable and very, uh, very reactive. Uh, they could be even reactive in a human body, causing a lot of serious issues such as cancer, mutations, and so on and so forth. And if they're uh, usually uh, made in lab, again, they're explosive, they're reactive. So we, we, we definitely do not want um, uh, to get any free radicals. And uh, the, the one thing I wanted to mention over here about the odd number of electrons is, is the fact that it would make it really hard to actually obey the octet if we have an odd number of electrons. Keep in mind that we're mostly talking about even numbers, so whenever an odd happens to show up, it just makes it really hard to actually draw the, cor uh, the, the correct Lewis dot structure. 
Now, I just want to emphasize that whenever I'm talking about a free radical, this is what I mean. I, I mean that I'm going to have one electron on the oxygen versus um, a paired, uh, 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 a paired uh, uh, set of electrons on the oxygen. This is something that I never, ever want to see. And on the other hand, this is, this is actually going to be the thing that I want to see in, in most of my structures. Now, keep in mind, you're not going to see many uh, free radicals in Kim 151. So in most cases, I do not want to see uh, any uh, um, uh, free radical on an oxygen or any element for that matter of fact just sitting by itself. Make sure to satisfy the octet as much as possible. But this does exist. Uh, it just exists in a couple of exceptions. And if you actually look at your post-lab uh, uh, questions, you, you might actually get asked about something of this sort. Now, the last exception to the octet would be the expanded octet. And this includes anything w that has uh, more than eight electrons. So we're pretty much talking about 10, 12, 14 electrons surrounding uh, an element. Now keep in mind that in most cases we try to actually satisfy the octet. Again, I've said this several times by now, but if we happen to have uh, one of these exceptions, which we're going to see right now, which includes the third period or higher, they might be able to actually exceed the octet and have more than eight electrons. Now let me uh, show you what I mean over here. This is our periodic table. Okay. This is period number one. Hydrogen and helium on this side is period number one. If we move on to lithium, beryllium, and everything that follows boron, boron, carbon, nitrogen, this is period number two. Once we move on to sodium, magnesium, aluminum, silicon, phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine, this is period number three. And this is what I'm concerned about in this point. Now, whenever I'm talking about the, the, uh, the expanded octet, I'm pretty much concerned about non-metals. So I'm concerned about something such as phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine, uh, uh, also over here, selenium, br uh, bromine, krypton, iodine, xenon, and so on and so forth. These are going to be the ones that you most likely are going to be able to see exceeding the octet, especially at this level of general chemistry. Okay, so um, uh, we're pretty much concerned about the non-metals for now, but keep in mind we could obviously have other examples, but for right now, let's just worry about the ones that I just listed over here. And again, we're, we're only concerned about we're only concerned about the third period or higher, okay? Now, I want to go over an example, okay? I want to go over an example of how to actually properly draw a Lewis dot structure, okay? I have an example of the nitrite ion over here, okay? This is the formula of the nitrite ion. The very first thing I'm going to do when I'm uh, uh, drawing a low st dot structure is calculating the number of valence electrons. Now, whenever I'm, whenever I'm calculating the number of valence electrons, it pretty much goes by the group number. So this is group number one, it has one valence electron. Group number two has two valence electron. Group number three has uh, three valence electrons and so on and so forth. So as we can tell, nitrogen is in group number five over here. So nitrogen has five valence electrons. So I'm going to go ahead and write five valence electrons for uh, nitrogen. And I'm going to also look up the oxygen. So oxygen is right next to nitrogen. And it has six valence electrons. So I'm going to write six valence electrons. I'm going to times it by two because I have a subscript of a two. So times two. Uh, I want to I want I want to actually emphasize the point that whenever you're actually taking the subscript, I highly recommend that you put it in parentheses. It just uh, it just helps you keep track of everything. And then for the negative charge, I'm going to add one electron. OK, keep in mind uh, whenever we're talking about electrons, a negative charge indicates that you're adding an electron. And if you have a positive charge, you're subtracting an electron. Now, uh, 6 times 2 is 12, plus 1 is 13, plus uh, 5 
should end up giving us 18 valence electrons total, okay? Now, um, an optional step that I like to actually do is to divide by the number of pairs, okay? Now, 18 divided by 2 is 9 electron pairs total, okay? Now, once you get your electron pairs, then you need to actually draw your initial structure. Now, when you're drawing the initial structure, the very first thing you should do is figure out what goes in the center. Now, obviously, nitrogen is going to go in the center for two reasons. The first reason is it's the only uh, uh, element that's by itself. Obviously, we have two, two uh, oxygen, so therefore, by default, the nitrogen goes in the center. That's the first reason. The second reason is uh, the fact that nitrogen is less electronegative than oxygen. Okay. Now, keep in mind, guys, fluorine on the periodic table is the most electronegative atom and cesium down here okay is the least electronegative so if we're comparing nitrogen and oxygen nitrogen is less electronegative than oxygen okay so therefore it goes in the center okay so i'm gonna put nitrogen in the center i'm gonna uh, uh, connect it with the oxygens using just simple uh, single bonds okay and now I've used two, two bonds in the initial structure, so therefore I'm going to subtract two electron pairs that were used, okay? Now 9 minus 2 is obviously 7 electron pairs remaining, okay? Remaining, um, and therefore I need to actually distribute 7 electrons, uh, electron pairs into my structure. So now I'm going to go ahead and distribute the seven pairs. I'm going to have to start with the outer atoms uh, before I move on to inner, uh, uh, to the central atom. So I have to actually deal with the oxygens. It doesn't matter which oxygen do I start on. Uh, the point is I have to finish the outer atoms before I move into the central atom. So I'm going to start over here on the right hand side. I'm going to start with the first pair, second pair, third pair. Okay, and they're always paired, by the way. Okay, so that's three pairs out of the seven. I still have four, so one, uh, or let me just continue. So one, two, three, four, five, six, and now seven. The seventh one is going to go in the center because um, uh, we've already satisfied the octet on all of the oxygens. Okay, now at this point, you should ask yourself, did I get the correct structure or not? Okay. Now this is when you're going to go into every individual atom and you're going to actually start uh, uh, figuring out or counting whether you have a full octet or not. Now if we look at this oxygen over here, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8, okay? And therefore it has satisfied the octet. If we look at the nitrogen, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. So therefore, no, it did not actually satisfy the octet. So that, that's actually wrong. And over here with the oxygen, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. So again, it has satisfied the octet. So therefore, this is not the correct structure. We still need to fix it. Now, whenever you're lacking electrons and you've done all of the work uh, correctly, this is when we, we need to actually introduce double bonds into the structure, okay? This is when I'm gonna actually have to steal a pair from the outer atoms and not the inner one, okay? I wanna emphasize the point, if you, if you actually steal the pair from an inner uh, uh, atom or the, the, the central atom, if you steal it from the central atom, you will get the wrong structure. So you have to steal it with one or uh, one of the outer atoms. I'm going to seal it from this side over here, and I'm going to take this pair inwards to make a double bond. Now, as soon as you make that double bond, you need to erase the, this pair that you've used. If you leave it over there, it will be a wrong structure. Now, keep in mind, guys, that you could have also made this bond on this side. It could have been an equally correct structure. So you could have actually stolen the pair from over here and made the double bond over here and left this as a single bond. And that would be equally correct. 
So this is what we actually call as resonance. And now I'm going to actually so, uh, show you what resonance actually looks like. So if, if, we, if, if we actually draw this structure, first of all, the one where you actually steal the pair from this side, you could get this type of structure. Okay. And this would be my first uh, correct structure. I obviously still need to include something to it. And then you need to actually draw the double-sided arrow indicating that it's in resonance or it's equally uh, uh, it's it's equal in energy to the other structure, which is the one we could have made by taking the stealing the pairs the the pair uh, the pair of electrons over here on this oxygen instead of that one. So I could have also formed this particular structure over here. And this, these two structures are equal and uh, equal in energy and they're both correct. Now the only other thing I need to include on this structure is I need to actually take into account the negative charge. So therefore I need to actually include the squared brackets. Whenever you have a charge you have to include the squared bracket and a negative charge on the left top corner. Same story over here. I need to include the, the squared brackets with negative uh, charge on the top right corner. Okay. Uh, one other thing to note is whenever you have resonance structures, you also include the the squared uh, brackets uh, on the the actual structure. So even if you don't actually have a charge, uh, you should probably include the the squared brackets. Okay. So this would be actually my correct structure. Okay. Now, one thing to note over here is we probably should double check whether we actually have the correct structure by checking the octet. Now, if we check the octet over here, we have uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. So th uh, this oxygen is happy. It's satisfied. It satisfied the octet. Over here, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. So again, it is happy. It has satisfied the, the octet. And over here, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. So again, it has satisfied the octet. So it is also correct. Okay. So, so this structure definitely satisfies the octet. My other question would be, does it satisfy formal charge or not? Okay. Now, I'm going to show you right now how to actually figure out formal charge. Now, there's obviously a long formula for formal charge, you can learn that, you, you will learn it in uh, lecture or maybe even in OCHEM. You don't need that really huge formula because you need to be quick in uh, what we're doing. So I'm going to show you the shortcut. Now the shortcut says that you have to take the number of valence electrons of the, every particular element. So in this case, we have an oxygen. So the valence electrons from the periodic table, if we look at the periodic table, oxygen is in group number six. So uh, oxygen has six valence electrons. Then we need to subtract the number of associated electrons. Now, whenever we're talking about the associated electrons, we're talking about the, the electrons associated with this oxygen only, okay? And this is when I'm gonna tell you to break that bond in half, okay? I have this squiggly line over here. You should never ever draw this squiggly line for anything other than formal charge, okay? Now, when I'm drawing this squiggly line over here, what I'm trying to remind myself is this oxygen only belongs to the oxygen um, uh, initially, okay? That's what we should have, uh, this, uh, this electron uh, initially belongs to this oxygen, okay? So I have one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. So six minus seven is a negative one, okay? So in other words, the charge on this oxygen is a negative one, and therefore I'm going to put a negative with a circle indicating that that oxygen has a negative charge. Now I, I need to do that for every atom, uh, for every element over here. So nitrogen has a uh, valence electron, uh, uh, has five valence electrons, and if I do the whole squiggly thing on both sides, I have one electron from over here, two from over here, and two from up there. So that's a total of five. So five minus five associated is a formal charge of zero. OK, 
silica. And if I do the same for oxygen, I have six valence electrons for oxygen. And then for the associated electrons, I have one, two, three, four, five, five over here, and six, okay? And six minus six is zero again. So that's uh, uh, zero, uh, that's a charge of zero for this oxygen and for that nitrogen, okay? Now this should make sense because I have a negative charge on this oxygen only and I have a total charge on this molecule as being a negative one. So this negative, the charge of the negative one is actually coming from this particular oxygen. This is why I'm actually getting the negative charge. So in other words, what I, what I just determined right now is that this structure uh, satisfies both the octet rule because I have eight electrons surrounding every atom. Uh, but on the other hand, um, uh, I do, I obviously, I do have a negative charge of one, okay, which is not the most ideal thing, but at the same time, we do have a negative charge on the actual structure, so this structure also satisfies the formal charge, okay, because the, the, the charge uh, on the inside uh, uh, matches the charge on the outside and I have zeros on both sides so we are minimizing the charge as much as possible okay so this structure is correct now we've learned about resonance I need to go over Vesper real quickly uh, now the Vesper theory the Vesper theory pretty much uh, tells us the accurate shape of the structure what it says is we need to have the, the bonds or the atoms bonded in such a way that they minimize their repulsion as much as possible, okay? Now, as you can tell over here, we have this uh, 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 table on the ChemWeb page, so you can look that up. Uh, you probably should dedicate uh, this particular uh, table to memory because you're not going to be given this on final examination day. So you need to be able to tell what's the molecular shape and the electron geometry. These two columns are the most important, by the way. Uh, obviously, the angle can be figured out. If you really know your shapes really well, you could figure out the, the angles and hybridization. I'll show you in a different video how to actually get that. Uh, so these are the two main columns that you probably should dedicate to memory, okay? Um, now, the first thing I want to cover over here with the Vesper theory is the generic formula. Now, as you can tell in this column, the generic formula comes in the form of AXE, okay? So it comes in the form of AXE. The A is referring to the central atom, okay? The X is referring to the outer atom, and the E is referring to the lone pair only on the central atom, okay? Only on the central atom. Now, uh, the reason why I went over the, the gen generic formula is because you need to be able to, uh, you need to be able to come up with the, the generic formula in order for you to determine the molecular shape and the electron domain geometry. Now, let's actually uh, write down the generic formula for this particular example that we were practicing everything. So if I write it over here on this side, because I still need this space for other things, so if I write A, X, E, okay, now how many central atoms do we have on this structure over here? As we can tell, we only have one nitrogen, one central atom, so technically I should be putting a subscript of a one, but whenever we have a subscript of a one, we just pretty much ignore it, and uh, what we end up actually uh, writing is pretty much nothing. A, a one is indicated by nothing. Uh, the X on the, uh, the other hand is going to be the, the outer atom, so we have two outer atoms, therefore I'm going to put a subscript of a 2, and then the E is the, the lone pair on the central atom, so I only have one uh, lone pair on the central atom, therefore it's also a 1. Now once we got our generic formula, we can move on to the, this uh, table. We can actually locate this formula. It's over here in the, the fifth row. Uh, now, it should make sense to you that we have a total domain of three. 
Now what the total domain is uh, talking about is how many things are hanging off of the central atom. Now as you can tell in this structure, this is the central atom, so I have one thing hanging off of the central atom, a second thing being the, the lone pair, and the third thing is going to be this this um, uh, 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 oxygen on the left hand side. So we do in fact have um, uh, three uh, uh, total domains. Now as you can tell over here it does actually tell us that there are two bonded atoms, uh, two bonded atoms and one lone pair so therefore the molecular shape is bent and the electron domain geometry is uh, a trigonal planar. Okay? Now the molecular shape over here says it's bent and the electron domain geometry is a trigonal planar. Okay? Now let me show you real quickly what, that, what that's actually talking about. Now over here, if, if I were to actually redraw this structure over here of the, um, either one of the, the resonance structures, by the way, okay, uh, just want to show you one thing. Uh, what the trigonal planar is actually talking about is if we're talking about a, tri a, a, a triangle of any sort, we obviously have this shape. Now what they're talking about over here is they're considering this lone pair as being an actual bond, which is obviously incorrect. But that's what the electron geometry is actually talking about. So it is talking. It is correct in the sense that they're they're considering the electron as being an actual domain and as an as an actual domain that's being taken into account. But we all know it's not an actual bond. Now, what the bent is actually talking about is when we're actually talking about these uh, uh, electrons over here. We know that each electron has a negative charge, so they're definitely repelling each other. And when they're repelling each other, they're pulling apart from each other, therefore pressing down on these neighboring bonds, okay? So technically, if you look at this triangle, the angle over here should be 120, okay? It should technically be 120. If this was a bond, this was a bond, and this was a bond, but because of this repulsion that's happening over here, uh, instead of being 120 exactly, these two electrons are even pressing down even more and therefore instead of being 120 the angle is actually going to be less than 120 okay so these bonds are not actually going to be straight in fact they're going to be actually bended this side is actually going to be bended a lot more than the other side over here and the reason for that is because you have a double bond versus a single bond obviously you're you're pushing one rock over here versus two rocks on the other side okay so they're they're both going to be bended but this side is going to be bended more than the other side okay and the last thing we need to do is actually take that into account in our structure. So instead of actually drawing the structures in a straight line as we drew them over here, we technically should include the correct orientation. So we, we, need, we need to bend this, uh, this uh, bond over here, okay? We need to bend the other side over here, okay? And include obviously our brackets, the, the double-sided arrow, and over here again, we need to bend this uh, side with the nitrogen go being up and the other side gets uh, bended even more and this over here would be the most ideal correct um, uh, representation of this particular example. Okay, And that should actually give you a full idea of how to actually draw uh, Lewis dot structures and, uh, um, uh, and uh, be able to actually figure out the Vesper theory.